Hello Chapel family, welcome to Church Online. Thanks so much for being here. For those of you who are new to the chapel, we wanna to get to know you. So make sure you fill out an online connect card. We're gonna be starting soon, so I'll see you in the chat. Well, hello, Chapel family. Thank you for joining us for Church Online today. Last week was just kind of a moment for me where I was really um, proud to be part of this church. If you were watching our service last week, um, you saw Pastor Dave speak up on an issue that uh, is kind of, I think, at the forefront of, of everybody's mind right now, and that is the incident with George Floyd and kind of the overarching issue of racial injustice and racial inequality in our nation. And it was just a moment for me where I was so grateful to be part of a church that doesn't shy away from difficult issues, but rather speaks up on them from a gospel-driven perspective. And I'm really excited by the steps that the chapel is taking to listen more, to become better educated, so that we can show empathy and respect and love to marginalized people, just like Christ did. And all of this can seem really heavy, right? But we can rest in the hope that God gives us through his son, Christ Jesus. The hope that we have that one day we will all come together and we will worship him as our king. And even though that day has not come yet, we have the opportunity right now to humbly ask that the kingdom of God come to earth right now as we spend time worshiping our King. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah to fight for me.
sang this song out together last week. Hopefully you've picked it up and you can sing it out with us again. I search no Show you 
Amen to that. So this last song that we're going to sing this morning is called Sons and Daughters. Um, some of you have probably heard of it. And I think that when we were choosing music this week, there just isn't a more fitting song because it just covers a lot of what's happening in our world right now um, and just brings us back to that truth that we are God's children, uh, loved by God. In 2 Corinthians 6, 18, God says... I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me. And I think that truth is just so encouraging during this time um, because it's a promise that God has for us, not just to have, you know, those words to hang on to, but that, that love to hang on to. And so I know that I'm feeling grateful for that today and that these lyrics have really resonated with me. And I hope as we lift it up together, they can really resonate with you too.
one more time together. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the Lord's and He will We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. Let's pray together. Dear God, you who just see all that is happening, God, in each of our personal lives, God, in this world as a whole, we know you weep with us, God, and we know um, we want what breaks your heart to break ours. So Jesus, we just stand um, worshiping you this morning and just grateful for the truth that we are your sons and daughters um, and the love that we feel through that. God, let us proclaim that love so strongly to everyone around us, each and every one of us, Jesus, just as you would. We just pray this in your name. Amen. Hey, Chapel family, good to be with you today. And I just think it's really important that we're all here today. Um, my name is Dave Gustafson. I'm the senior pastor here at the chapel. And I want to take just a moment to acknowledge all those who are with us for the very first time today. So it's kind of an interesting thing to visit a church for the first time and experience that church during a pandemic lockdown. But here we are, and I just don't think it's any coincidence that you're here. So may God bless you as you spend this time with us today. Thank you for coming. You know, as we've walked through this last week, we have seen all kinds of different images 
And uh, I, I believe some of those images have been very encouraging. Some of those images also have been kind of disturbing. But as we continue in worship today, I just want to put an image in all of our minds that I think can guide our thoughts as we go through the rest of this service. And, and the image is this. This picture was taken a couple days ago at a protest in New York City. And obviously, it's a picture of members of law enforcement along with a representative from a protest group who are kneeling down together in prayer. You know, so often our energy and our attention is focused horizontally, out, outward to, to other people, and, and it needs to be. We need to be in dialogue, we need to be listening and, and debating and interacting with other people. So the horizontal is necessary, but this picture is just a reminder to us that where the power is really found is in our vertical relationship, our relationship with God. And so as we, we gather here in the midst of the storm that's going on around us, we are here to nurture this vertical relationship through worship, through hearing the word of God, this becomes stronger. So let's, let's make this stronger today, this relationship, so that we can go out from this place and do this, the horizontal, um, much, much better. I wanna thank you for your generosity toward the chapel. Um, because you've continued to be generous toward the chapel, um, we have been able to turn around and uh, support significantly our, our partners in, uh, in Patterson, Star of Hope Ministry in Montclair, Salvation Army. We've been able to, just this last week, significantly um, help the work of New City Kids, another one of our inner city partners, um, with uh, a project to help their teen interns. We've been able to help one of our key partners in Bogota, Colombia, and many other things. So I know this is a challenging time, those of you who have been able to be generous throughout it, just know that that is helping us to make a huge difference. So thank you. Let's just pause and devote today's offerings to God. Our Father, today we do come into your presence wanting so much to nurture our vertical relationship, our relationship with our Creator. Lord, thank you that you are a Creator who loves us, who gives us grace, who equips us for everything we face in life. Today, Lord, help us to grow stronger in you. And we are thankful for how you have provided for us. Lord, through these offerings today, we want to give back some of what you have first given us. So, Lord, receive these now, our gifts of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, everyone. I'm Samantha, and welcome to the chapel. As you know, families are very important to us here at the chapel. That's why we're planning an upcoming family dedication service. If you would like to dedicate your son or daughter, then simply email louise at thechapel.org and we'll follow up with you with more information. This past week, we shared our plans for restarting in-person services here at the chapel, and you can find those plans on our website, thechapel.org slash restart. We also hosted a Q&A session with our staff this week, and if you missed it, you can find it also on our website under past services and events. Coming up the week of July 13th through the 17th is our Chapel Kids Camp at Home Edition and our Chapel Students Lockdown Games. This week's gonna be packed with fun games, lessons, and a couple of surprises. Your children aren't gonna wanna miss this, so make sure to sign them up today so they can get involved. Thanks again for joining us today online. Make sure to check out the rest of our website while you're here and comment who you're sharing this Sunday service with. Well, as I have watched the events that have been taking place in our country, it became very clear to me early last week that the wisest thing for me to do today would be to step aside and not be the one to preach, to, to give the pulpit to someone who's maybe a little better qualified to speak at a moment like this. And so today, it is my honor to introduce to you Bill Page, Bill is a 20-year veteran of the New York City Police Department, serving as both, both a police officer and also for a time as a detective. Bill, for about 35 years, has been involved with a Christian ministry called Young Life. He has traveled the world and spoken uh, on behalf of Young Life Ministries. Uh, Bill is a, uh, a published author. He's an ordained pastor. But most importantly to me, um, he's my friend, and I trust him. And so I want to just ask that you give a very warm chapel welcome 
That's right, I want you to clap right there in your house a warm chapel welcome to Bill Page. Well, good morning. I uh, counted a blessing to have an opportunity to share with you today. Uh, this isn't my first time here at the chapel. I've spoken a couple of times before. Uh, but the Bible tells us to know those that labor among you. And uh, so I'm going to share some things about my life, and I'll share some things about the Word of God. And the only thing I really want you to do is take a look at what God might be saying to you, what God might want you to do. How does this Word resonate with your life? Um, the Bible says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. And so God really always wants to speak to us, and he always wants to give us direction. And so we're going to go there today, you know. Uh, I want to share a little bit about my own life. You know, life is filled with storms. And the one thing that we don't get an opportunity to do, we don't get an opportunity to choose what family we're born in. We don't get an opportunity to choose what color our skin is. We don't get an opportunity to choose our gender. We just come into this world and things begin to happen. And as a result of things happening, you know, we're all products of people who have loved us and people who have not loved us. And maybe in our lives, we've had people who've loved us well and people who've not loved us so well. And so as I share a little bit of my life, this is my story. And the Bible lets us know that we can overcome by our testimony. But I was born and raised in New York City, and I grew up in a very dysfunctional family. Of course, I didn't know it was dysfunctional when I was growing up, uh, but I grew up with a mother who was involved with organized crime. I didn't realize it was organized crime until many years later when I took it for granted and I began to investigate organized crime many years later as a police officer. I was the victim of child abuse at her hands. I didn't know it was child abuse uh, until many years later as a youth detective. When I first became a detective, I began to investigate child abuse, and I looked back on those things and I said, wow, this is what mom did. Uh, my dad, he was an incredible man. He, he was very faithful, went to work, came home, loved me unconditionally. And I had two cousins that lived in the house, A.B. and Betty. And Betty lived a, a wild lifestyle. She was 15 years old when I was born. And some of you heard me tell this story. She was 15 years old. And then she lived a very promiscuous lifestyle in front of me. Many times I saw things little boys shouldn't see. Uh, and then I, as I began to get older and I began to get angrier from some of the abuse that I suffered, uh, mom died. I came home from school, I was in the sixth grade, and I came home from school on the last day and some of her friends were at the house and they said, Bill, we got some bad news for you. Y your mom passed away today. And um, I remember taking my dog for a walk and I, and I remember uh, crying. And even to this day, I don't know why I cried. I don't know if I was mad, glad, or sad, but I felt that some of that drama and some of, that is some of those issues would stop. Uh, uh, the other cousin I had, was his name was A.B. He was 18 years old now, and when he sees me come home that day, he sees I've been crying. He goes, why are you crying? And I said, well, I'm crying because mommy's dead. And he says, well, so what? She's not your real mother. Betty, the girl you think is your cousin, that's your real mother. And I do believe a storm began to gather and to pick up momentum in my life that day, and things began to spiral out of control. Um, as I said, I lived in the Bronx, went to an all-boys high school. As soon as football season ended my senior year, I quit school. I began running the streets and hanging out with a crew that was doing bank robberies and murder, and some of my friends were arrested for bank robbery and murder. Uh, the best man at my wedding, as a matter of fact, did an armed robbery and, and went to prison. Um, I joined the military to keep from going to jail. Uh, and I went in the military, and I went in there this wild kid, and I stayed in the military for three years and um, was a military policeman. And I'll never forget what, the, what it said on one of our police cars, obedience to the law is freedom. And uh, I was out of control, and I was such a hypocrite as a, as a police officer because I didn't know Jesus at that time. Got married while I was in the service to my first wife, who has since gone on to be with the Lord, and now I've remarried and been married for a little bit over five years. Um, but I took those vows, and I did not have the power to keep those vows. And it did not take long before I was committing adultery and I was just angry and acting out in all kinds of different ways. And then I got out of the military. And this is shortly after the assassination of Martin Luther King. And I was very angry and I was fairly militant. And I went on the police department. And I'll never forget putting my hand on the Bible and raising my other hand and, and taking these vows to uphold the Constitution and the laws of the state of New York. But I didn't have the power to live that out. They gave me a gun, they gave me a badge, they gave me a uniform. But the one thing they didn't give me, they didn't give me power. 
They gave me authority, the authority to take your life, the authority to take your freedom, but I didn't have power. And as a result of not having any power in my life, I began to abuse that authority. And then I believe my past began to catch up with me, the pain, the hurt, the brokenness, the wounds. And I began to medicate myself with, with alcohol and substance abuse. My life was a shambles and I was a wreck. Uh, I got fired from my first police job. Uh, it wasn't really a major thing, but I was let go. And I'll never forget the anger that rose up inside of me and for me at that time, everything was the white man. The white man did this. And I was not able or unwilling to take a look at my own behavior. And it wasn't the white man, it was you, Bill. But as a result of that anger, as a result of the storms that were raging in my life, I made up my mind to kill the police commissioner. And shortly after, I got another police job. And yet and still, I took another vow and I still had no power. And people began to tell me about Jesus. And Jesus was okay for folks like y'all, but he wasn't for me. There's no way in the world that Jesus could like somebody like me. And I was such a hypocrite, but I was violent and I was angry and I was abusive at times. Uh, I got on the SWAT team. I went to an anti-sniper school at the FBI Academy down in Quantico, Virginia. And so I was proficient in, in the things that I was called to do, but I didn't have power. I had authority. And you know what? Sometimes things are out of control. Somewhere along the line, we need someone to come and to step into the storms that are raging in our lives. And so they began to tell me about Jesus. And so before I tell you uh, about what happened to me, I want to tell you a story from the Bible. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the book of Mark, in the fourth chapter, in the 35th verse, it says it this way. In the Philip's translation, on the evening of that day. It wasn't just any day, it was that day. Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. One of the things that Jesus is most quoted as saying is, come on, follow me. So Jesus calls his boys, he's been teaching all day long, he's in a boat, and they took him just like he was, and they went to the other side of the lake. And maybe it was a day like today, high 85, not a cloud in the sky, and all of a sudden, that day changed. All of a sudden, the wind begins to kick up. All of a sudden, the winds are turbulent. All of a sudden, the sea is being churned up and water is breaking into the boat. And the Bible tells us that Jesus was asleep. He was out cold. And the disciples are bailing. They're bailing for their lives because the last place that they want to end up is in the bottom of the lake. Wow. I don't understand how Jesus sleeps through this storm. I don't know if he's pretending he's asleep, but the Bible says he was asleep on a mat. And these guys are just bailing. They're bailing. And, and I, one of my favorite disciples is Peter. What I love about Peter is that he's real. He's always real. He's not always right, but he's always real. And so as he's bailing water in panic mode, he looks over and he sees Jesus asleep. And he says it in the Philistine translation, he says it this, don't you care that we perish? Wow, things aren't going the way that he wanted them to go, and he begins to blame Jesus for not caring. And even though the Bible hadn't been written to the way it is today, the Bible says that we can cast all of our care upon him because he does care for us. But Peter didn't know that that day. Don't you care that we perish? And I love this, that Jesus comes out of this sleep. And what I love about Jesus, nothing really bothers him too much. The only thing that kind of bothers him are religious people, people who think they know what God is like and they don't have a clue. So I love it. Jesus wakes up, maybe, and he looks at this storm, it's raging, and then he says this, peace, be still. Another translation says, and he rebuked the wind and he calmed the sea. In other words, he stopped what was causing this storm and then he dealt with the effects of that storm. And the Bible says, and there was a great calm. Whoa. And then Jesus turns to his disciples. He turns to you and I. And he looks at us and he says, where's your faith? Why did you doubt? They said, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? They don't realize who they've gotten themselves hooked up to. And I've said this many times before, they don't know who's hooked himself up to them. 
Because it's Jesus who says, you did not choose me. I chose you. I called you. You didn't ask to come. I called you. He's called you. He's called me. He's saying, follow me. And he says to you and I, where's our faith? Why do we doubt? You know, they were in the boat with the Prince of Peace, and they didn't have any peace because they didn't tap into the strength and the power of Jesus. And to make matters worse, they thought he didn't care. I come back to my story now. December 26, 1980, at 2.45 in the afternoon. I had been a police officer for 10 years. I was an alcoholic. I was very violent. I was very angry. I was very abusive. Abusive as a police officer, abusive as a husband, abusive as a father to my sons. I didn't know Jesus. And that particular day, I got real. I was watching television, and the man on TV asked two questions. He said, hey, and it was almost as though he was in my house. He said, hey, are you a sinner? And it was almost as though he was talking directly to me, and he was. And I began to talk back to the television. I said, yeah. He said, do you know Jesus? And I knew about Jesus because growing up in the 50s, you had to go to church. I had heard about Jesus, but he seemed distant. He seemed like he was in heaven. He didn't seem personal. And it didn't seem like he cared that much about me but I knew about him. He said, do you know Jesus? And I said, no. And by this time, for whatever reason, I was crying. And he said, call this telephone number. And I called that telephone number, and I prayed with the man, and I received Christ into my life. And the Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, anyone, including you, Bill Page, if anyone is in Christ, they become a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Wow. When I received Christ in my life, I was filled with a peace and a joy that I never had before. I was filled with a love that I never had before. I was filled with the reality of what Paul says we all get when we receive Christ in our lives because God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. For the first time in my life, I had power. For the first time in my life, I felt really what love was all about. For the first time in my life, I do believe I had a sound mind. It was awesome, but nobody believed me. I had peace. Jesus had stepped right into the middle of the storm of Bill Page, and he said, peace. Be still. One of the other things that happened immediately was God gave me an understanding as to why people do the things they do. Because they're sinners. Why do people rob banks? Because they're sinners. Why does a man beat his wife? Because he's a sinner. Why do people lie? Why do people steal? Because in most cases, they don't know who Jesus is. And I worked with men and women who didn't know who Jesus was, was or is. I worked with men and women who had storms raging in their lives. I worked with men and women who were racist, some of them. All of them? Absolutely not. Did all of them know Jesus? Absolutely not. Did some of the ones that didn't know Jesus do their job in an ex exemplary way? Absolutely. Far more conscientious than me, and they did it well. And I believe that's only because of the grace of God. You know, one of the other things that happened immediately is that God changed my heart and my way of looking at people and my way of dealing with circumstances. And one of the things he gave me immediately was a love for that police commissioner who fired me. And I had to tell him. And so one day, shortly after my salvation, I went up to his office. He usually has a security police officer there. He wasn't there for some reason. And I walked right into his office. He's seated at his desk. He had heard about me on, on this new job that I got. And he had heard about some of the crazy things, I guess, that I had been doing. And he looks up and he goes, you're a page, aren't you? 
And I said, yes, sir, I am. And I said, I need to share something with you. I said, I'd made up my mind to terminate your life. But I want you to know that Jesus has come into my heart. And I love you. And I'm going to be praying for you. And I would, if I ever write a book, I would love to write about that. And this is what this man said. If God did that in your life, you can write anything about me that you want. And God gave us tremendous peace and reconciliation with one another that day. Only God can do that. But we have storms. All of us have storms. There are things that happen in our lives, the things that go south. It begins to do things to us. You know, there are reasons for the way that we act. I don't think there are too many excuses, but there are reasons for the way that we do things. And so as I gave my life to the Lord, I began to saturate myself in the Word of God. I would just read and read and read. And, and when I would read, I would say, show me me, Lord. You know, speak, Lord. And I would even ask you that today. As I'm sharing with you, as you're hearing things, you know, be like little Samuel and he speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. The Bible says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. What does God want you to get out of this? What does God want you to do? And so I read about the books of, book of Acts, and I saw all the wonderful things that happened in it. And when I'm finished here today, if you don't mind, maybe if you read Acts 6, 7, 8, and 9, it's an amazing part of the Bible. And when I read the Bible, it turns into a movie for me. And so the church was in need. They were in need of, of some people to take care of things while the apostles went out and preached the word of God. And they chose some men. The Bible says these were men who were filled with the spirit, men who had wisdom, and men who were of a good report. And one of those guys, his name was Stephen. Stephen, the Bible says, did incredible things, and God worked many miracles through his life. But one day, he was confronted by some men in a storm. They're in a spiritual storm. Really, they're in a fog. There could not be nothing worse than being in a storm and being in a fog at the same time. And they had a tremendous disdain for the people of God. Yet and still, these men represented God, or they felt that they did. And so they, they got some men to, to make some false accusations against Stephen. And, and, and they said, this guy's saying this, and this guy's saying that, and they bring him in, and, and, and they stand Stephen in the synagogue, in God's house, and they begin to question him. And Stephen, very calmly, and the Bible says, even with the look of a face of an angel, begins to tell them the word of God. Begins to tell them the things that they think they already know. And I would think in their zeal, they're getting more and more angry at Stephen. They don't know what to do with this man. And I could see them standing there in a rage. And then there comes a point where Stephen says, they are the cause of the death of Jesus. And there, it was almost like Popeye. I can stand all I can stand and I can't stand no more. And some of you young people out there, you can ask your older parents what I'm talking about right there. And the Bible says, and they took Stephen out, outside of town, and they stoned him. They stoned him. And Stephen, the Bible says, took a knee. And before there came a time that he couldn't breathe anymore, before he spent his last breath, he looks up at heaven, and just like Jesus, Father, do not lay this charge against them. And then the Bible says, and he fell asleep. Wow. Who was this guy? Who was this man? 
only the Spirit of God can enable you to respond in such a way. Only the Spirit of God can enable you to pray for those who are trying to kill you. For what? Simply telling the truth. Being put to death for telling the truth and being put to death by men who feel they know God. The words of Jesus come to pass right here in John 16, 1. Jesus says, I'm going to tell you these things so you won't be afraid when they happen. Paraphrasing a little bit. He said there's going to come a time that they're going to drive you out of the synagogue. And they're going to kill you. That's what they're going to do, but why? Verse 3 says, they're going to kill you, Jesus speaking, because they don't know the Father and they don't know me. Wow. Here it is in living color before everyone. Stephen stoned to death, asking for their forgiveness, and no one came to his aid. No other Christians came to his aid. Maybe they peeped, maybe they saw, but they didn't help as he breathed his last. Maybe there was nothing they can do, they felt. But I believe that there's always something you can do. Well, there was a guy there. I can really relate to this guy as far as behavior is concerned. His name was Saul of Tarsus. He had a storm raging on the inside of him. He couldn't stand the people of God. He couldn't stand the people who were called of the way because that's what they call Christians in that day because Jesus is the way. And the Bible says, and those men that stoned Stephen laid their cloaks at his feet. He gave consent. In other words, he was one of the ringleaders of this gang. And the Bible says this about him. He wreaked havoc in the church. A man who represents God, he wreaked havoc in the church. The Bible says that he would break into houses and take away fathers and mothers, separating them from their children, just like slavery of old. The family was ripped apart and they would take them. And by his own confession, he would say that he would take them to the, to the synagogue and he would punish them and he would even make them blaspheme the name of God. He had a storm raging on the inside of him. You might even call him a racist, but this has nothing to do with race. But at the very least, I would call him a spiritual bigot for someone to dare not believe what he believed when it came to the things of God. Though he represented God, he broke so many of the ordinances that God had laid down. And he was wreaking havoc, and the church was in a mess. And the church began to scatter. And they began to tell people about Jesus, and the church began to grow. Another thing about him, the Bible says he was so filled that he breathed threats, how about this, and breathe murder, murder against any of those people. And he went and he got, and the message translation says it this way, in, in, in Acts 9, he went and he got warrants of arrest. So now he's acting almost like a police officer. He's got warrants of arrest. Arrest for what? For people who love God for people who have done no wrong, people who are innocent. And he got warrants of arrest. And the Bible says, and he even went to foreign countries. And on this particular day, he goes to a city called Damascus, breathing threats. I wonder how many times he went to bed angry. I wonder how many times he allowed the sun to go down on his wrath. I wonder how many times he ignored the verse, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I shall repay. I know how I felt about that verse in the past. Don't trouble yourself, Jesus. I got this one myself. So filled with rage. And he's going to Damascus. And what I would like to do, I would like to take us 
and make us the Christians in Damascus. And we hear, Saul of Tarsus is coming. He's coming to town and he's coming to get us. <coughs> and we run away and hide. And maybe one of you runs away with me. But we go the wrong direction and we end up on the road to Damascus. We see Saul coming and we hide in the bushes. And then while we're watching, in fear, our hearts are pounding, our faces are red as our blood pressure has risen. All of a sudden, Saul, a light comes down from heaven, brighter than the noonday sun. It surrounds Paul and a voice comes out of that light. And we know, you and I know, this is God. And probably to a certain degree, it's like, yeah, he's going to get his now. Yeah, it's about to be on up in here. And the voice cries out to him as he falls to the ground, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Calls him Lord, because whoever's talking, he realized he's a bigger shot than him. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you persecute. Maybe you and I are in the bushes and we look at each other. Yeah, we see what he's going to do now. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks, Jesus says. And then Saul says, Lord, again, Lord, what do you want me to do? And it's amazing to me. More or less, Jesus says, get up, go into the city to a street called Straight, and someone will come and tell you what you're supposed to do. And because he was blinded by the shining, dazzling light, he is led into the city. But Jesus has begun to quell his storm. And he sends a man named Ananias to him. Ananias doesn't want to go. He even gets into an argument with God about it. He says, hey, we heard a lot about this guy. This guy is wreaking havoc. And the Lord corrects him and says, don't worry, he's my chosen vessel. And I've got a work to do in him and a work to do through him. The Bible doesn't say it that way, but that's exactly what happens. And so they go and they lay hands on him and scales fall from his eyes. And the Bible says, and he stays there a few days or some days with the disciples in Damascus. And after that period of time, the Bible says, and immediately he arose. And guess where he went? He went to the synagogue. And the Bible says, and he began to preach about Jesus. And the people in the synagogue says, isn't that the guy? Isn't that the guy who used to wreak havoc against anyone who was of the way? And now he's preaching? People were astonished. Astonished just because Jesus stepped into the storm of one man. One man who became a champion of the faith. One man who preached the gospel. One man who let it know, be known rather, that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because I know it. It is the power of God unto salvation to anyone who would believe. To the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. He wasn't ashamed to be counted amongst the saints of God. The storm in his life was quelled to such a degree, literally they had to kill him, to shut him up, to keep him from talking about his Lord that was coming back from glory one day and how the dead in Christ would arise. What a transformation. It would be him who would write, therefore if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Going back to the day of my salvation, if there's racism in police departments, and I believe there is, it's because there are people who don't know Jesus. There are people rioting and looting because they don't know Jesus. Nobody gets a get out of jail card. There are reasons, but no excuses. What we see on television 
not just this incident, but other incidents that have taken place, are people who need Jesus. They need the God that lives inside of you. They need the God that wants to make a difference through you so that you can make a difference in their lives. They're all around. This is a spiritual deal. It's a serious deal. It's an ongoing deal. But we have the answer. And the answer is not an it, but the answer is a who. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Bible says for you and I to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that's in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. To go out and to make a difference, to go out and to love our neighbor, to go out and be a light. In Philippians 2.5, I like the way it says it in the Phyllis translation. It says that Jesus be your example as to what your attitude should be. God says to you and I, you really want to see how to live life? Take a look at how my son lived life. Let him be your example. Let him be your pattern for living. Allow him to speak into your life. Allow him to do in you, in me, the things that he wants to do in us, to root out things that he doesn't like, things that get in the way. We need that power. We need that love. We need that mind. The Bible says, let the mind of Christ dwell in you. That's what he wants to do. That's what he wants to do here on the hill, Chapel sir, people. He wants to make a difference in you so that he can make a difference through you. That you will be a shining light, that you will be salt in the earth because you've allowed Jesus to step into the storms of your life. Lives are being taken wrongly. Injustice is being done. And it needs to be changed. And God says in his word to us, if my people, you and I, who are called by my name, you and I, will humble themselves and pray, you and I, and seek my face, he says, and turn. Turn from everything in us that's not like him, from our wicked ways. Then, he says, then and only then will he hear from heaven? Will he forgive our sin? Will we become a delightsome people? And will he heal our land? There are storms raging in our world today. We have the answer. Let's take him to him in Jesus' name. Thank you. Hey, as we close up here today, let me just say a prayer for us. Father, we thank you today. I thank you for those that are tuned in. I thank you for your love for us, for them. I ask you to move by your spirit in our hearts. I pray that you would give us our marching orders. Your word says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons and daughters of God. And we pray that you would lead us. We pray that you would deal with the stuff that's in our lives. We pray that we would open our hearts up to you and allow you to have your way. Search us, O oh God. Create in us clean hearts. Renew upright spirits within us. And then, as Jesus said when he was 12 years old, let us be about the Father's business. We thank you for that today. We can't change anything we've done. We can only learn from it. Allow us to go forth as new creations in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. I appreciate you allowing me to be with you. Hope you enjoyed today's service. To stay connected throughout the week, make sure to check out our website, thechapel.org, or join our online campus Facebook group. Looking forward to seeing you all soon.